Good evening, and welcome to Exploring Black History at the College of Charleston and Beyond. This program is brought to you by the College of Charleston Alumni Association with support from our generous alumni annual sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, we are able to broadcast this program live from PDA's COVID Safe Studio in North Charleston, South Carolina, and record and post it to share with others. I'm Derek Williams, president of the College of Charleston Alumni Association. Joining me tonight is Professor Emeritus Bernard Powers. Dr. Powers has taught history at the College of Charleston for nearly 30 years. He's the author of a book entitled Black Charlestonians. Most recently, he co-authored We Are Charleston, Tragedy and, Tri and Triumph at Mother Emanuel. He also established the college's center for study of slavery in Charleston. In our most recent alumni survey, Dr. Powers was named among, amongst the most highly regarded professors in our entire college. I'm very, very happy to uh, present Dr. Powers this evening. In addition, Dr. Powers serves as Interim Chief Executive Officer of the International African American Museum, currently under construction on the Charleston waterfront. This is scheduled to open in 2022 in Charleston, and we're excited to have that open. We want to welcome Dr. Powers, and thank you for agreeing to take us on this journey. Sure. Thanks for the invitation. Glad to be here. Now, Dr. Powers, um, I was so excited when I was asked to um, interview for this, this webinar and for our, our audience here. I know that they're as excited. Um, I will tell you, I've heard about you over many, many years, but uh, this is the first time we've got to actually um, uh, interact, so we're all looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, Dr. Powers, um, tell us, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in the city of Chicago, the south side of Chicago, in fact. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I know that you grew up there, spent many years there. How did you get, get to Charleston? Well, uh, Derek, I went to graduate school at Northwestern University, studied history there, eventually finished the PhD in American history. I had a concentration in 19th century U.S. history, and I developed a real interest in uh, the period of the Civil War and Emancipation and Reconstruction. But I was interested in a couple of other subjects that I was able to pursue as a graduate student also. Um, I was interested in urban history, particularly the development of cities and their African American populations in the 19th century. And there was something else that was, uh, that was very intriguing and it was becoming an important area of study during the time period. And we're talking about the period of the, the, early the early to the mid 1970s. And that was the transmission of traditional African culture to various places in, in the New World, South America, the Caribbean, the United States, and so on. And so when I began to read about Charleston, South Carolina, a place that I had never had an opportunity to visit, I realized that I could bring together all of my various interests in uh, the 19th century, Civil War, Reconstruction era, as well as the survival of traditional African culture in the United States in this one city. And so it was that recognition uh, of those things that propelled me to and gave me the incentive to come and visit Charleston for the first time in 1975 and never been to South Carolina before. And uh, I was here for a week and then I came uh, the following year, 1976, and I lived in Charleston for about six months doing the major part of the research project that eventuated in my, in my degree and then the book that you referenced, Black Charlestonians, also. So that's how I, that's that's how I got here for the first time. Um, I really liked Charleston and the Low Country, and uh, at, as a 
as a relatively young man, I was about 26 or 27 years old at the time, uh, I made a pledge to myself that when I retired, I was going to retire to the city of Charleston. That's how much I, yes. I love this place. So you were speaking in, into existence already even before yes. it happened. Yes, yes, yes. And, 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 and as I tell people, uh, since I worked at the College of Charleston for almost 30 years now, uh, I got here a little bit early. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> now, so your, your studies began at, at Northwestern, um, yes. early 70s. So this would have been um, obviously after the actual civil rights movement and yes. um, I yes. guess integration had, had occurred. Was that one of the, the impetuses for your, um, your, your want to study the, this area? Yes, um, because there was, a, there was really, during that time period, a, a, a flourish of scholarship and interest in African American history and the way in which it reshaped our understanding of American history. Uh, and that interest was really propelled by the momentum of the civil rights movement and the kind of intellectual ferment that surrounded the advancements that were occurring, not only on the legal front, you know, in terms of voting rights and the downfall of Jim Crow, uh, but also in terms of the kinds of demands that students were making also as they integrated traditionally white institutions, they were demanding that uh, their lives, their stories, and those of their ancestors be reflected in the curriculum that they were, that they were studying in these Absolutely. schools. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I believe your time at Northwestern, you not only got your undergraduate um, de degree there, but you got, got your PhD as well. Well, I got, um, um, I got my undergraduate degree at a, at a small liberal arts college in Minnesota by the name of Gustavus Adolphus College, a, a small Swedish Lutheran school, but did the, the MA and PhD at Northwestern. Yeah. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Now, um, now, when you got to Charleston, what were some of the subjects that, that you taught there? Yeah, well, uh, at the College of Charleston, for for uh, most of the time that uh, that I was part of the regular faculty, I taught a survey of African American history. It was a two part course uh, or, or a two part sequence. Uh, the first part began with the African background and came into the period of the American Civil War, and then the second part picked up with the Civil War and came to the, the present time. So I did that course uh, regularly. Also uh, did some uh, specialty courses in African American history. So I taught courses on slavery. I did uh, African American uh, uh, historical biography. I taught a, uh, a course on uh, essentially the Black Atlantic. Uh, in other words, the experiences of African people in the Caribbean, in the United States, uh, in parts of Europe, and so on, that whole Atlantic, Atlantic Rim. And uh, I also did a civil rights course also. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. But I'm mainly, I'm mainly an 18th and 19th century uh, student, and uh, kind of toward the, uh, the, uh, the latter part of my career, I began to move a bit into the 20th century and add, added the civil rights course on. Absolutely. Now, besides your teaching, um, what other responsibilities or jobs did, did you have for the college? Yeah, uh, and so at one point, I directed, directed the master's uh, program in history. I did that for about eight years, and uh, we offer uh, a joint program with the Citadel. And so that is a, that is a good uh, opportunity for us because it allows us to pull together the faculties of, of both universities. Right. Uh, and so I did that, and uh, I also served as uh, associate chairman of the department for a number of years, and, uh, and actually uh, interim chair uh, while the department looked uh, for a permanent chair. So, so I had some administrative experience also. Yeah. Well, you know, we were fortunate to have you at the College of Charleston for many, many years. And uh, one of the things you and I talked about, I was a, an English major, but yes. I hate I did not take some of your, your courses. I think I would have enjoyed them a lot. 
Um, now, in terms of your 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 teaching career, mm -hmm. how is teaching at the College of Charleston different from maybe some other institutions you you've taught at? Yeah, and so uh, I taught I taught African American history at Northeastern Illinois University, which is in Chicago. The Golden Eagles, I uh, think they are. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. That's right. <laughs> I had to look that one up. Okay, so. okay. So uh, yeah, I was I was there eleven or twelve years. Um, and uh, taught African American history there, but also um, I was I was the uh, for the history department. I was the local Africanist, also, and uh, that's that's kind of interesting too because uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, someone who had a specialization in African American history was also expected to do some training. Uh, in African history so that you would be prepared to at least teach some basic courses in that area. And right. so at Northeastern Illinois, I did, I did both of those areas as well as, um, as well as U.S. history. You know, one of the things that I found uh, quite a contrast between teaching the subject there and teaching it here is that uh, at Northeastern Illinois at the time, and I don't know how it is now, but at this time, there were virtually no white students that took African American courses. But when I came to the College of Charleston, it was, it was not unusual for the class uh, to have 50% white students. And, and I really think that, that really says something about the difference between the North and the South even today. Yeah. And what that says is, uh, even in the modern period, there are lots of uh, white Southerners who recognize the kind of organic um, connections that blacks and whites have had in the South historically, and it's been very different in, in the North. And so, uh, therefore, they, they, they really saw uh, investigating African American history as, as uh, a way of also learning something about their larger experiences too, as Southern, as Southern people. I yeah. never thought about that, but I think that's an, an excellent point because we probably historically have thought the more progressive mind that people would be up, up North or, or go to schools up North, but I've never um, <laughs> actually heard someone say that. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, yeah. There were not any you know, um, uh, white students attending your your classes up up north. Which that's is, right. Um, that's that, right. That's right. There were very, there were very, there were very few at that time. And you know, as I say, uh, um, now obviously there has there's grown and developed a lot of interest uh, amongst white students even in the north now. But at that time, I had yes. I had very few at that time and at northeastern Illinois. In terms of the African American experience um, when you first started, how has that changed over over time as you were teaching down, down at the college? Yeah, well, um, you know, when I started, there were there were three of us. Well, actually, there were there were two of us that were that were doing coursework in areas related to this subject. Um, the late Alpha Ba in the history department. Uh, you might have you might have known him or heard of him. No, I know who that is. And, yes. Yeah, and Dr. Ba did African history, and uh, and I did African American, and uh, and then at Avery, the director uh, of Avery, uh, Marvin Delaney came, yep. and Marvin really did African American. He did the 20th century. Uh, I did mainly 18th and 19th century, but you know um, what has happened over the years is we have many more faculty members who teach other aspects of the African and African American experience, and so and 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 this gives you a I think uh, a good sense of of how. Um, what we offer at the college has really grown and blossomed because, you know, I can, I can remember it was probably the spring 
1993, my second semester there, uh, we implemented an African American studies minor. And Eugene Hunt of, yes. uh, from the English department, Absolutely. Uh, who I think was, he was certainly one of the earliest and perhaps the first uh, tenured African American faculty member there. Uh, and so Eugene Hunt was involved in, in promoting this, and we got that implemented in the spring of, of 1993. And of course, now there's a whole African American studies major, right? right? Uh, we have uh, an African American studies uh, program. We have an African, uh, we have an African studies program, a separate unit. We've got uh, a Caribbean, uh, studies minor, I think. And so we really have seen the blossoming of right. this area and uh, in terms of teaching far greater sophistication, more courses, more faculty members, doing, doing really a variety of things. Literature uh, has, uh, has really blossomed. Yeah. And Seems and like first. there's been a lot of crossover. Um, yes. I know it, as I was taking English courses there, um, Pro Professor Simon Lewis um, yes. Does a wonderful course um, on, on African literature. Yes, that's right. And, uh, but it seems like um, as um, the, the departments grew and our understanding grew, there were more courses. So you weren't just that's confined right. to, the, to the history department right. to learn about certain things. Oh, so. oh yes, yes, yes. And, uh, in, fact, in fact, just uh, uh, several weeks ago, I was talking with uh, Angela Halfacre. And Angela used to head up the... Um, uh, the master's program in environmental studies. And uh, they, they did a variety of things in that program. And one of the um, uh, theses that she directed had to do with uh, the use of sweetgrass, uh, sweetgrass in the construction of the sweetgrass baskets, baskets that are right. sown over in Mount Pleasant and all along Highway 17 and so on. So, Absolutely. so that's just another way. And here, some someone might say, well, environmental studies, that doesn't have anything to do with African-American history or culture, but it does. Right. And, that's, and that's just one example. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Now, um, obviously, there's been a lot of changes since you first started, but sure. um, what other things have you done to, to contribute either from a curriculum standpoint, or either on, on the campus, um, yeah. what, what are the things that have you been involved with? Yeah, well, as, as I have uh, promoted my own research um, activities, I've gotten students involved in, in various projects that I've worked on. Um, uh, I've, I've directed uh, students' theses and senior, uh, senior papers in the history uh, department. And of course, now, uh, I'm heading up the Center for the Study of Slavery in Charleston, which we started in uh, the fall of 2018. So we are still in our infancy and defining ourselves and so on. Um, but you know, that project is, is very important because we are part of a consortium of over 50 universities that are examining the role that slavery played in higher education, mainly in the United States, but, but there are some universities in Canada and in the UK that are also part of the same consortium. And uh, you know, at, at the College of Charleston, we have about 20 faculty members that are working with the center, and we're doing a number of things. We are we are conducting research, uh, looking at, um, for example, uh, the use of slave labor in the construction of some of the earliest buildings on the campus. Uh, we are looking at uh, buildings on campus that, that have uh, African American histories themselves, perhaps they may have been owned by uh, 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 African American owners before the college acquired them. We are uh, looking at the way in which African American history can be infused into the tours that are off offered of the campus. And also, you know, when one thinks about our center 
and it's called the Center for the Study of Slavery in Charleston. That is somewhat of a of a misleading okay. uh, title, uh, in the sense that yes, we do focus on slavery, but we also look at the legacy of slavery. And when you think of the legacy of slavery, called it it casts a long shadow all the way down to the present time. Um, and, 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 and so the questions about uh, race relations on the present campus and the climate, uh, the racial climate and atmosphere and all of that, these are part of the, uh, the legacies and the consequences of the fact that slavery existed at one point in, in time. Right. And, and, and so finally, um, since the institution of slavery and racial discrimination uh, uh, created social harms, one of the things that the center also is seeking to do in conjunction, not only with the college, but with the surrounding community, is to figure out some ways in which we can uh, alleviate some of the harms and adverse consequences that have existed as a result of racial discrimination, which was a product of slavery at one point in time. Got you. Yeah. So the the um, center for the study of slavery is more encompassing than just focusing on slavery itself. Absolutely. The the the, the ramifications and effects of it as well is important. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's you know, absolutely right. One, one of the things that um, thought about um, as we were talking earlier this week and kind of prepping for this, you know, here we are in Charleston. Obviously, so much history here. Um, one of the original thirteen colonies. Um, obviously the major um, bottleneck for, for slavery and, um, and slaves being brought here to our, our city. Um, uh, we're at the College of Charleston, 13th oldest school in this country. Um, mm -hmm. um, actually formed and founded before our country was even formed. Yes. Um, what um, history on the college's campus itself, how does that enhance um, what you are doing now with your center and um, in some sense, this collaborative effort with other colleges. Oh, yes, sure. Well, you know, um, I mentioned the consortium that we are a part of, the, it, and it's known as the University Studying Slavery Consortium, over, okay. over 50 universities. Well, there are five of us uh, right in South Carolina. So uh, Furman and the Citadel and USC, let's see how many in this. Is that, and there's one other one. That there's I'm, one more besides us. Yes, uh, and and let's see, the, uh, that name is escaping me right okay. now, but I may think. But there are five of us in the state, and 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 so we're looking to collaborate with one another, share information, learn uh, from our respective approaches, so that we may want to borrow a technique that they've used that. Clemson is the other university. Clemson, okay. At Clemson and incorporate that way of investigating uh, the role of slavery on our campus, and we might want to do that over at over at uh, the Citadel. Uh, we're also uh, working with the. Um, uh, the uh, the new museum that's in the that's in the process, you know. Um, the International African American Museum is scheduled to be open in 2022, but it's already beginning to do some programming. So we're not going to wow. wait until we have uh, the building fully constructed to to uh, to begin to work with people. And so, in fact, uh, in fact, the center uh, this past spring. We had a program uh, symposium, in fact, that we were going to offer jointly with the International African American Museum on our campus. And it was um, a program that surrounded the question of reparations and what reparations consist of and, and, you know, and so on and so forth, kind of getting at the social justice aspects of uh, repairing uh, 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 the harms that have resulted from from uh, systematic racism in in our society, and so that's one example of of a collaborative activity that uh, that we had in the works. Unfortunately, the pandemic came along and caused yeah. that. 
Uh, but we change a lot of things. Folks. Yes, it yes <laughs> yes yes it has it has, but we are looking to perhaps be able to offer that this spring, uh, uh, perhaps with uh, another university in the, the so. metropolitan area. So a lot of what we're doing is based on and promotes collaboration, and uh, you know, uh, it will present uh, numer numerous opportunities for discussions, for people to think in new ways about, about their lives, their futures, the communities that they're a part of, right. and, uh, and, how, and how we can all be part of a solution to this difficult conundrum that we've inherited but we have to solve in order to make the kind of progress that, that we need to make as a yeah. society. And the college is playing an important role in doing yeah. so. Well, it's good to hear that you know, we're at the forefront um, yes. uh, of pushing this forward. Because one of the things I've, I've thought about, um, even here in South Carolina, um, is the experience maybe in, in the low country may not be the same as in the Midlands where I live or in our upstate area. So That's right. it is good to hear different colleges are on board with yes. this um, because I think the more information, the more knowledge that we have in these areas in this subject, I think um, enhances what, um, what, what you all do or, or, sure. or the, the historical nature of what we can find out. So that's right. I think that's, that's right. great. That's right. That's right. And, and that will, you know, lead to greater cooperation, collaboration between, between our universities in the state and also uh, the museum. Uh, is uh, although it's located in Charleston and there'll be plenty on the low country and, and, and this area, it has it's, it's focused the entire state. And as we look at the history of the state, that's going to be the springboard to exploring the larger international experience of African people Absolutely. in the Caribbean, the Atlantic Rim, including Europe and Canada, and so on. Absolutely. Now, obviously, our talk tonight is about exploring black history at, yes. at the College of Charleston and, and beyond our, our borders. How has interest in African-American studies and history grown in the larger metropolitan area since, since you've been here? It has. You know, it, it has grown tremendously. And, uh, Derek, as I mentioned, I, uh, I came to Charleston for the first time in the middle 1970s. And I can remember I took the boat ride out to Fort Sumter, and uh, on that boat ride, the National Park Service um, ranger kind of gave a, a lecture on the coming of the Civil War to prepare you to take the tour of the, the fort when you got out there. And Derek, I remember this just as clearly as anything that you have said this evening. When uh, that ranger went through the various causes of the American Civil War, uh, the person talked about taxes and states' rights and two different cultures, North and South, but there was, but there was a key factor that was never mentioned. Not a word about slavery whatsoever wow. as, a, as a driving force for the coming of the American Civil War. Right. That was the middle of the 1970s. Now, uh, we have a Fort Sumter Visitors Center, which is adjacent to, it's almost adjacent to the site where we're constructing the museum. And when you go in there, there is a sophisticated introduction to a uh, broadly based and comprehensive uh, treatment of the coming of the Civil War, and slavery is appropriately incorporated into um, the several motive forces right. for the war to come. Right. And I can let you in on something also, that one of the part rangers who was in, involved in designing the script and that presentation is one of my former students. Oh, wow. Yes. So your, your impact <laughs> yes. lives <laughs> on and continues on. That's you know, right. that, that's a that's fascinating right. point that you just talked about. So. I would imagine then in the 70s, even at historical sites, um, I guess there was this, um, maybe this ignorance that um, um, slavery in and of itself was, 
you know, yeah. the, you know, the the war between our states. That was one of the main impetuses. So that's right. kind of fascinating to, to actually hear that. That's right. And uh, and likewise, if you if you took tours of the uh, historic homes in downtown Charleston, or if you went out to the plantations, for example, out on Highway 61, if enslaved people were mentioned at all, they were never called slaves, they were called servants. Uh, and, and typically there was, there, was, there was very little, if anything, said about them. Of course, now this has changed dramatically. It has changed dramatically. And so uh, if you go out to Middleton Place, Drayton Hall, Boone Hall, Magnolia, uh, Gardens, uh, all of these places, uh, McLeod uh, Plantation, uh, they have African-American focused tours right. where you can spend an hour learning about the African-American experience at these sites. Um, and, and the big push that, that we want now is uh, while we like the African-American focused tours, we also want to ensure that that black experience is incorporated into the tours of the homes and the grounds. Absolutely. So that, uh, so that the visitors to these places uh, are essentially required, regardless of how they uh, go through the tour, to learn something about this experience. Right. And that's the way it would have been during, let's say, the 18th century or yeah. the antebellum period. Visitors to these, to these homes or plantations, there would have been no escaping the presence of black people there who were the vast yeah. majority of, of the residents. So uh, in many ways, this experience has been um, uh, embraced uh, wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of times I think dealing with history painful as some of it is, yes. is being honest about what that history was. I yes. mean, um, yes. we, we can't go back and change it, but, but that doesn't mean that we can't recognize exactly what was going on. And I think a full understanding is, you know, when you go to these type historical sites, knowing exactly everything that actually happened there, not, yes. not, not, a, not a glorified or Hollywood type version. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, gone, gone with the wind uh, and so on and so forth. Those days, those days are really over with. And I'm, and I'm happy to say that in the course of my career, uh, I have been periodically called upon by some of these hist historic sites to do some consulting, offer some advice, and so on. And I have uh, colleagues in the history department and some uh, that I know from other departments, anthropology, for example, that have similarly uh, been called upon to work with these sites to improve the visitor experience there Absolutely. and to, 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 to heighten uh, and make more sophisticated the way they present the African-American experience. All right. You know, um, one of obviously the um, most tragic recent events that's happened in our state in the Charleston area is the mother, Emmanuel, yeah. um, you know, what, what happened there. Um, from a historical standpoint in dealing with some of the, the issues and some of your, your teachings over these years, how does an event like this, a tragedy, um, maybe help enhance how we understand our own history or even dealing with that. Sure, sure. Um, you know, what happened there really uh, opened up many people's eyes to the uh, ferocity and the uh, virulence of racism even, even in the 21st century in America. And, and some people who hadn't, who really hadn't thought about it, were forced to, 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 to question whether the way they had lived their lives and the way they had, and whether or not perhaps they had insulated themselves from the problem and therefore contributed to it. 
uh, and, 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 and to lots of people, lots, lots of white Americans began to rethink their relationship to, to the ongoing practice uh, of American racism. And, and they began to realize that just because they didn't see people uh, uh, wearing white robes and rallying around burning crosses, that didn't mean that racism was gone. It just assumed different different forms. Uh, and, and, and you know, some of the recent ferment and um, everything surrounding the Confederate monument is part of the reverberations of that awareness, because people people recognize that uh, some of those monuments and places and names and so on and so forth represent the continuation of that right. of that series of racist yeah. practices that suggested something um, about American life and American society that needed to be questioned and then corrected and so and so mother Emanuel really tr triggered a wave of introspection Throughout the South, that's still yeah. going on now. Uh, of course, that you know, it started with the tragedy there, and then the Confederate flag being removed from the State House grounds right. here, uh, and most recently, uh, John C. Calhoun coming coming down in Marion yeah. Square. Something that I thought I would never see. Right. Uh, and that and all of this just steps away from our. Our geographical borders of the college. That's which, right. Exactly um, right. You know, exactly I, I right. think, you know, for an institution like ours, which is a liberal arts type college, where mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, my understanding and um, a broad based knowledge of our world and how to interact in this world, I gained a lot of it there in a, sure. one of the most historical cities in our country, yeah. but dealing with a lot of historical um, tragedies here. Mm -hmm. um, it makes for kind of an interesting dichotomy we've, we've all had to deal with, couple that with the statute and Mother Emanuel not being very far, I think. That's right, um, that's right, um, that's right. From a historical standpoint, um, that in and of itself, and then from a humanistic standpoint, mm -hmm. um, I think we all have a shared experience or some connection to it. Yes, we do, we do. And, and, and you know, that's, that's the thing about Charleston. There's so much African-American history throughout the city, but a lot of it is hidden. A lot of it is hidden. You have to know where to look to see it. And so all of our efforts at the center, the African-American studies program at the college, the museum, and not just us, they're doing things over at the Citadel also, are designed to make the invisible much more visible. So, you know, and one of the, the most glaring examples in terms of a structure is the old Citadel building right there, you know, one block from our, right. our campus. And uh, that place is constructed uh, 20 years in the aftermath of the Denmark Vesey slave conspiracy. Well, now it's the Embassy Suites Hotel, and people walk past that all the time having no idea that it's a very important African American history site. Wow. You know, wow. uh, and if you know where to look, uh, if you look on the uh, south side of that building, there's a little plaque about the size of a notebook, and it has the whole timeline for that 19th century building, and it starts with the year 1822, and it says they began to fortify this area in the aftermath of the denmark Vesey slave conspiracy discovery. It's right on the building there. Oh, wow. So, so it's an example of a hidden historic site uh, that, that we're trying to give a higher profile Absolutely. to. Yeah. I will look for that the next time I'm there because yes. I did not know that's that right there. you just yeah, said that. That's so. right. That's right. Um, what kind of opportunities exist um, on our campus and in other places for students to develop skills and learn about some of these subjects you, you've taught for years? Sure, sure. Well, one, one of the things that the history department has done at the college um, is has, it has established a series of internships 
that, um, that are offered in collaboration between the department and various historic sites around the city and throughout the metropolitan area. So we've had, uh, we've had students work at the South Carolina Historical Society, the, um, the Charleston Museum, uh, Historic Charleston Foundation, and uh, sometimes they, they work on African-American oriented projects, if that's what they're interested in. It could be other, other historic uh, uh, episodes and, uh, you know, and subjects that they have an interest in or preservation. We've had, uh, we've had a few students from the Citadel. We've had some from the college to work over at uh, the museum. Uh, to work with us doing internships over there also. Um, and you know, one, one of the things that our Center for the Study of Slavery hopes to do uh, down the road is to offer a course on the history of the College of Charleston. Now, some people who don't know any better might think that that would be a parochial kind of a course, but it, it really would not be. The idea is you could take the College of Charleston and use that as a, as a center or focal point for looking at crucial issues in American history, yeah. throughout, throughout our history. The American Revolution, obviously the, the Civil War, right. the Spanish-American War, World War I, the Civil Rights Era, all of these things uh, could be explored through our campus and through the history of our institution. And that's how we're thinking about that. The other thing is, um, you know, we have a we have a committee at the center that is invest that is doing research, uh, doing research uh, to discover issues of slavery and race related matters on the campus and in the surrounding areas. So the faculty members who have undertaken that work will use students that have an interest in those subjects to to partner with them and it'll be an opportunity for the students to to learn uh, research techniques that'll be helpful to them um, if they're history majors and or uh, regardless of what their what their majors are so there are a lot of opportunities for wow. for students to participate in this work well, something that, that you just said I never thought about but on our campus itself um, and from a historical standpoint Obviously, this is our 250th year, formed in 1770. So before the country's even birthed in yeah, 1776, that's right. our college was around. But if you look from a historical standpoint, pretty much every major event, there's something that probably happened in Charleston um, uh, that directly either impacted it or the college was impacted by that. Um, I know in, in Dr. Morrison's book, Nan Morrison's book mm -hmm. on, on, on her history, one of the things I um, learned was um, during different time periods, World War One, World War Two, if students got drafted, you know, the college during those years for certain time periods may not have been open. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, obviously, there's um, portions during the, the civil rights movement. Certain things happen, um, administrative changes, and certain things that were done. But I've never thought about that. Um, that you really could um, use our city and and the College of Charleston itself as a historical teaching point for this country. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really being an original colony, the birth of our nation, and then everything else. That's right. Um, we've had these flashpoints in history that um, I think our college has kind of highlighted certain things. Yes, yeah. And, and, and you know, let, let's, let's think about it this, this way. Um, the Avery Research Center, which is a part of our library today, uh, that division of the library, which focuses on the African American experience in South Carolina, mainly, uh, that is not only part of the library, but is it is a very important, as you know, historic site that really dates back to the immediate aftermath of the American Civil War. Uh, it was the first school in Charleston for African American students, expressly. Uh, and not just uh, a school, but a school with an advanced curriculum. Uh, you, it, it had the 
normal designation. The Avery Normal Institute is what it's called. So uh, the expectation was that if you enrolled in Avery, you already had the rudiments, the lower level skills that you acquired. And then you went on and you pursued higher level courses right. and you learned how to become a teacher or you did college preparatory courses uh, at Avery. And students left Avery and they went on to Howard University and Talladega and similar and Fisk University and so on and, and so forth. So right there, here is a part of the College of Charleston, a building that has a wonderful African American history that 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 really uh, continued uh, as an independent entity until uh, just before it was acquired by the college, right. and it was acquired by the college uh, in the middle uh, middle 1980s. Yeah. So, well, you yeah. told me a fascinating uh, story um, about Avery and trying to find it when you first got here. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, uh, w would you just share a part of that? Yes, yes, yes. Because uh, yes, and this was this would have been in the late the late eighties, and and uh, I happened to be in Charleston for a research trip, and uh, I had I'd heard about uh, the Avery Institute. And so I was, I was, I was, I was on a campus, and I was asking various people uh, that I ran into, uh, people who, some of the men had on ties, so they looked like they were authority figures, and uh, and others, and 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 no one, no one knew where Avery was. So I kind of finally wandered into the the old science building, and I saw one of the uh, African American custodians there. And I, and I asked him if he knew where the Avery Institute was. And he says, oh, yeah, sure. Just walk right on down <laughs> Bull Street. You'll it's the pink building. Now you'll run right, right into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, of course, and, of course, for him, you know, he knew Avery because he was probably right. part, of, part of the community and grew up there. Absolutely. And all of and all of that. Well, with so much history there, it was a little bit harder to find than than you would have imagined. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. That's now, absolutely. um for our African-American alumni in our college, um, what message would you um, give to them at this time, and, and particularly to those who might have graduated a while ago, just like myself? Yes, yes, yes. Well, the college, the college has, has grown tremendously in terms of what we've been talking about this evening. Um, you know, as we said, there are, there are more African-American faculty members on the campus representing far more disciplines uh, than were the case when I started 30 years ago. But not just, not just African-American faculty members, but faculty members of all races that have an interest in what we've been talking about and who make a contribution, who make a scholarly and a pedagogical contribution to these subjects. And, 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 and so, I mean, you know, if you have an interest in African art, African history, uh, learning about the Caribbean, uh, learning about the, the experience of black people in the Atlantic Rim, uh, if, 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 if you're, you have an interest in obviously African-American literature, but for example, uh, I have a colleague in uh, the African-American Studies program, uh, Dr. Anthony Green, who does a course on African-Americans in sports. He does a course on uh, African-Americans, I believe, and, and, and comics. I, I mean, just about Anything you can think of, people are studying. And this really shows a, a broadening and a right. deepening of the curricular offerings that are available yeah. at the College of Charleston. You know, and this really is, it is the fruit and the maturation of the Civil Rights Movement. When you think about it, 
because you know when 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 black students got admitted to the college, in fact, this is what happened in my experience. This is why I'm at, I've been at the college <laughs> because students who were admitted eventually. They raised the question. They said, well, why aren't we present in the curriculum? And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, by um, fits and drabs, so to speak, uh, courses were, were added. And eventually, uh, the college was interested in hiring me and, and others. Right. And that's how we got to where we are today, you know. And so we've got this new center. The Avery Research Center has been, it's undergone a two-year renovation, yes. lots of programming will go on over there. And we have, uh, and when I say we, I mean those of us who do these subjects, we have important connections to uh, other institutions of higher learning right. in the city and around the nation. Yeah and around the nation. And all of this is to the, the great benefit of, of our students and, and the larger yeah. community that we hope will take advantage. Well, it sounds like some of us as alumni need to re-enroll and take some of these other courses because yes. it's a plethora now yeah. that um, when I was coming through, I don't know yeah. that all of those were actually yes. yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Kind of along that same vein for um, the center, um, for the study of slavery, what can alumni do, if anything, to assist or maybe help with, with those efforts? Yeah. Well, uh, go to our website, which is uh, right now under reconstruction, uh, but we are we are hoping to uh, put together a much more uh, sophisticated website. So take a look there. Okay. You'll see our programs that are that are up and coming. You'll see the kind of latest information that, that uh, we can provide you about our subject. And also, there is a way to make a contribution, a financial contribution, through our website. So take a look at that also. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Powers, what would be something about the College of Charleston? You've told us something about in the city where the MC Suite said, but maybe something about the College of Charleston as it relates to African American history that most people, most of us may not know. Sure. Well, uh, a couple of things. One is, you know, I think about this all the time. Uh, the building uh, uh, right on St. Philip Street, where the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences yeah. has his office now, uh, that is a building that has an African American history before it was owned by the college. That dates back to the period before the American Civil War, was owned by a free black woman, I believe in the 1850s, as early as the 1850s. Uh, and she was a, a pastry cook or a chef. And uh, that building was passed down in her family for a period of time, and really until the modern era, maybe the 1970s, and the college acquired that, that building. And so when, whenever I go in there, I think about that history and that heritage. And that's one of the things that, that we want to do on the campus. We, we want to provide signage so that passers-by learn some things about the buildings on our campus. Absolutely. The other thing, uh, just very quickly, is that um, uh, the library is constructed on a site that, and, and some people know this, on a, on a site that was formerly owned by the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church acquired that property from um, African Americans that had a burial ground there wow. that dated back to the end of the 18th century. In fact, uh, when the construction was done for uh, our library there, there were some human remains found. And so, so, for example, if you go behind the library and you, to the green space there, you'll see some monuments that refer to the old burial grounds that were located there. But unless you really know the history, 
you look at those memorial stones and they really don't have yeah. much in the way of significance Absolutely. for you. So we have to have a, a way to tell a more complete story of the sacred ground that the library occupies today. And so that's another very important space on the, on the campus. Well, we won't pass by it anymore without knowing something else about it. Good. So. Good. Uh, Dr. Good. Powers, I can't thank you enough um, for sharing your incredible insights with us and to our history and our, our community and our college. Um, we know our audience appreciates it, and we hope you will join us again soon. So thank you so much. Well, I certainly look forward to it, and thank you so very much for the gracious invitation. Absolutely. On behalf of the nearly 95,000 members of our Alumni Association, thank you for joining us this evening. We hope you will join us again very soon on October 29th for our next webinar um, with my friend and alumni, Dr. Michelle Cooper, class of 1995, where she will be discussing the CFC's path towards equity and opportunity. Good night.